success. Check all these handsome Hello. boys. Yo, Hello, boys. Ooh, what's up, Jay? Hey, bud. Hey, man. How's hey, it guys. going? Good, man. Nice to see you, boys. Yeah, yes, you. look at that artwork, buddy. How's it going, Sia? Yeah, how's it, boy? Uh, good, yeah. Third time's a charm, man. Yes, we did it. How's it going, man? Yeah, all right. Yeah, there was some, uh, I see there was some setting deep in Windows, which is blocking microphone access. I'm not entirely sure what. Ah, cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us on our second panel discussion. Uh, tonight uh, or today, we're going to be discussing two sort of very interesting and important topics, and those are artificial intelligence and universal basic income. So uh, I'd just like to basically start off with a brief introduction. Maybe you guys can just tell us a little bit about yourselves, and uh, maybe Sia, you can lead us off. Excellent. Okay, so the name is uh, Sia Gule. I uh, originally born in Swaziland, uh, and uh, but very much a a naturalized South African at this stage. Uh, my background is in uh, financial technology primarily, uh, and I'm currently working for a bank uh, within their sort of you know, foreign exchange, um, you know, doing digital, etc. But my interests are definitely quite far ranging. Um, definitely very interested in, in technology, obviously, uh, technology strategy, but then also everything from, I guess, you know, psychology, um, history, and, uh, and, and current affairs. Um, so, so, yeah. Definitely looking forward to this discussion. Brilliant. Thanks, my man. And uh, Mr. Pickering, Gareth Pickering, give us a uh, lowdown. Who are you? I am who you say I am. And uh, <laughs> Gareth Pickering, I am uh, South African. I find myself in Mexico at the moment. I have been traveling for four years and I'm sort of on the digital nomad path. So I'm um, working specifically on um, internet based projects and um, I have an advertising background. For 10 years, I ran my own advertising agency, and at the moment, I'm in um, education and technology and working on a few projects in that space. Um, don't have a huge amount of um, sort of formal understanding of um, AI and uh, UBI, but um, read a little bit about it and um, listened to some people much smarter than me talk about this stuff, and I find it interesting. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to chatting to you boys today. Brilliant. Sure, no. We chose two pretty minor topics, eh? Not, uh, not yep. <laughs> cool. so, uh, so Sean Nicholson, also South African, currently uh, residing in, in SA, born and bred in Asburg. Um, other than a two year stint uh, overseas based in London and, and traveling around the world, trying to do a bit of uh, some of what Pickers is doing, um, doing at the moment, except I think a little bit cleaner than what, uh, what he's doing at the moment. <laughs> Also in, in the financial game, similar to SIA, uh, we actually used to work together until a couple of years ago. Um, work for a business called Iris, um, which is a uh, Australian listed fintech business, top 100 uh, ASX business. And my role is head of our financial markets uh, business in South Africa. Um, yeah, also similar, similar interests like all things tech, AI, um, machine learning stuff, algos, like the, all that stuff is having a huge influence on I suppose definitely the financial markets and, and financial world, um, but but way broader than that. Um, also, a, a love for all things sport and exercise and um, things like uh, kite surfing, a bit of snowboarding. Fortunately, not a huge amount of snow in SA. Um, <laughs> hope to go and do it. But yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Cool, man. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Thanks for those great intros. So, also just thanks to Gareth uh, Pickering for actually joining all of us, you know, like you put together a mastermind group a while ago and uh, that's how we kind of all came about of knowing each other. And it's been, it's been an interesting way of getting to know each other, I guess, uh, via WhatsApp, <laughs> which has been quite fun. Um, yeah. So just a little bit about um, what we're going to discuss today. We're going to discuss AI, which is artificial intelligence and UBI, which is universal basic income. And it's worth pointing out that none of us are experts by any stretch of the imagination. We all we're all just really sort of inquisitive and curious people and it's stuff we are interested in because it's, it's sort of part of our everyday lives and we're sort of touched by it a little bit maybe in the jobs that we do um, and in just the things that we kind of listen to. So just a little bit, I guess, to kick things off, 
we're going to start off with um, AI. And it's, it's really interesting because it's, AI has actually been around, you know, for many years now. And it's becoming sort of more integrated into our day-to-day -day lives, even though we don't think about it. You know, most people are not aware that, say, like, you know, your Google Maps um, or an, an app like Waze, for example, that is constantly using artificial intelligence to kind of help direct you uh, using a, ma a Maps app. You know, so it's, it's really becoming more prevalent in our day-to-day -day age. Um, and there's much more sort of advanced methods of AI that's also sort of, you know, coming, becoming prevalent. Um, so it's just important to know that there's, there's simple ways it's happening already and it's becoming more and more and more. And, you know, we've all listened to some interesting chats recently, um, especially I think uh, Elon Musk talking on the Joe Rogan show. Um, so, yeah, we'd just like to open it up to the sort of um, table and just have a thought and your, you know, give us your thoughts on AI, uh, how it's um, maybe impacting your life and kind of where you feel that it's going in this world. So, Sean, we know that you love this. You might as well sort of step up to the plate and kick things cool. off. Cool. Peace the skids. All right. So, um, I suppose first point is that this thing's happening, right? It's not a concept or something that people are thinking up or, or, or dreaming about like it's happening um, and it's not coming linearly it, it, the, the growth of AI and, and as we put more and more develop, developments into it, um, it it's going to come exponentially um, and they reckon the human brain can't necessarily understand that exponential growth. We understand linear growth and um, that, that's the first point is that it, it's going to start building momentum and, and just happening quicker and quicker and, and there's obviously this point called singularity that, that everyone talks about, um, which is hypothetically and meant to be the point at which we, at which we lose control or at which um, self-learning and, and, and all machine learning and, and all that takes place and the machines start kind of developing themselves independent of humans from there. Um, I don't think it's going to be as blatant as that. I, I think it's going to be way more gradual than us just waking up one day and all of a sudden um, there's robots walking in the street. Um, the, sec or the next point is that I definitely think it's more going to be about a concept of AIs or, or AI in the plural uh, rather than singular, that there will be specialist um, AI robots, machines, what, whatever you want to call them, rather than this one autonomous uh, beast that, that can do all things. Um, two analogies that help me um, understand or, or I think have made the concept of AI more accessible and, and what it could potentially mean to humanity once it's reached that point, whatever that singularity means, um, is the first is people liken it with, uh, with extraterrestrial contra uh, contact. So imagine we knew that in a year from now, we were gonna get visited by some extraterrestrial beings. Um, how would we start planning for that? How would we wanna portray ourselves as humans? Um, what kind of messaging would we wanna give them about ourselves? Uh, how would we integrate them into our society? Uh, and, and that's how we should be looking at this whole AI thing. I, I find that analogy quite interesting. Um, another one that's a, a little bit more, bit more scary, if, you, if you're a bit more cynical about it and think that, uh, that, that AI could end or, or mean some kind of end or, or doom for humans, is the analogy of, of humans and chimpanzees. Now, that difference is like only a couple of chromosomes, right? It's 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 pretty small. Um, but how much attention and, and and that do we give to 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 chimps every day? How much do we think about them? How much do we interact with them and and have anything to do with them? All of a sudden now you're going to have AI that is probably a few more degrees of separation, sophisticated than than humans. What kind of interest are they going to give to to human life? Will it be a hundred percent integrated or? Will it be a little bit more like the, the human chimp analogy? Um, yeah, that's uh, that, that's it for a start. That's a pretty yeah. interesting start. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. Uh, so yeah, like you know, you also have some some good thoughts on this. What do you? Where do you? Would you like to kick it off? Yeah, I think um, maybe just to pick up from what Sean was saying about. Uh, how gradual this would be versus uh, all of a sudden waking up and uh, and it's you know terminated to two hundred thousands in the streets. I think it's definitely 
it seems to be the case that it will be incredibly gradual and then you know all of a sudden right um you know extremely rapid uh and uh, and, and so for me i'm still a bit caught uh between i guess you know all of these people much smarter than 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 i am uh you know there's almost they're grouped into these kind of separate camps where you know some guys think this is an incredibly dangerous exercise we should be treating it the same way we treated the manhattan project uh, and then on the other side you know guys think that you know ai will be the last thing we invent and uh, and then it's sort of uh it's rainbows and, uh, and unicorns from that point on. Uh, and and, and I, I'm not sure which, I guess, which of those realities ultimately is the one that comes to bear. I, I definitely think it is important, though, to, to recognize that this is, is happening. Uh, I guess to your point, Gareth, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of, of examples of AI, you know, quote unquote, low level AI uh, being used already in a ubiquitous fashion uh, from the processing that's happening on your photos, uh, you know, to, you know, some of the examples that you've listed already. And so the gap between these very specific AIs that do a task, uh, you know, play chess really well, play Dota, um, you know, do uh, image recognition, et cetera, versus kind of, I guess what they call strong general artificial intelligence, whereby now you've got something which is as smart or vastly smarter than humans. And is also can, you know, can, can, uh, use its intelligence in a general sense. I think the gap between those two is still quite large, and uh, and so for me, I'm not I'm not sure how soon that happens. But I think if we do invent, uh, you know, strong general artificial intelligence, most certainly it'll be the last thing we invent. And uh, and I'm not sure whether that's a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So are you worried about this, Gareth uh, Pickering? Um. I I don't know. And the reason that I don't know is that I don't know that anybody knows um, because these things, like Sean said, they are being developed individually and people are working on different things. My concern around it is I think that um, the US and China are sort of in a massive race to make sure that whoever gets the smartest AI first holds all of the cards in terms of a, an arms race, in terms of military power and um, the commercial effect of that is is really big for both of those economies and i think i think while um machine learning and those sorts of things are going to have a massive impact on bettering the lives of human beings as we go i think there's a potential opportunity for machine learning to make a massive impact for the good i don't think we've completely wrapped our heads around exactly what this animal is going to look like when it comes out and how it's going to understand and process how we understand things to be as human beings, you know, it's the, the chimp analogy is a really good one because, you know, w as a chimp, you, you have no concept of a human being sitting in a Zoom call with five other people having a conversation and the technology that went into that. A chimp has no clue. And the gap between that and us is so big. And I think it could be orders of magnitude bigger when we are sitting trying to get, wrap our arms around something we've created that can potentially do the type of stuff that we have no idea what that's going to look like yet. And I think my concern for it as well is we, we can't presuppose and write into the code of exactly what those animals are going to look like. And I think it presents some challenges in terms of it's getting away from itself because the machine learning happens at a rate that we're not going to be able to stop. I don't think when it kicks off, you know, and um, you know, there's that analogy that I heard the other day about the computer that they designed to play chess. And it was sort of its first, um, I can't remember the name of it now. I think it's like 2.0. I can't remember the first part of the name of it. Maybe one of you have heard the story. They designed this AI to learn how to play chess. And uh, it taught itself in the same day how to learn to play Go and then beat the world's best Go player within a couple of hours. Like it didn't even learn to play Go. It just understood that it needed to learn these moves and then it taught itself so quickly that within a couple of hours it had beat the world's best Go player. And Gareth, while that's amazing... Is that uh, yeah. AlphaGo Zero? AlphaGo yeah. Zero, yeah. There was a Zero and then there was the next one, wherever it was. But like, yeah, that's, everyone stood around and gave each other a big pat on the back and said, that's amazing. And it is amazing, except that what if that got completely out of control and learnt in half a day, you know, it, it stretched ahead of where we would be able to keep our arms wrapped around this challenge. And so to answer the question, I think um, I'm, I'm really excited about this stuff, but um, I, I, I just, I believe that we should be tackling it with a healthy amount of skepticism. And my concern around it is I think 
I think there's too many people operating AI projects in isolation and not enough people sitting around one table saying like, this could potentially get away from us, present a massive challenge to humanity. And what are we doing about that? Because I don't think you're going to get the Chinese and the Americans around the same table to talk about humanity as a, as a concern when they place this thing. They just want to race in individual projects to make the best AI. And that's, those are my concerns around it really. Yeah. Yeah, those are, those are good concerns. For sure, yeah. I mean, I would just like, I mean, we did, unfortunately, you can see there's only five South Africans here. We did hope there was going to be six. Uh, Elon Musk was one of them, but he couldn't yeah. make a chat today, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm sure you guys uh, watched the chat that he had with Joe Rogan. There, there was two things in there that kind of tie in with our chat quite nicely, actually. And one of the two things that stood out for me was the fact that human intelligence is only going to become like uh, what, like less than a percent of overall intelligence once AI kicks in um, because there's just going to be so much more AI going on and it's just going to kind of overtake all intelligence, which was fascinating and scary and all those things at the same time. And then the other one was he seemed initially really concerned about it. I think he is really concerned about it uh, overall. And, you know, he said he particularly just went to a meeting with Obama and it was just him and Obama. And he said the only thing that he wanted to talk to Obama about was AI because he was concerned in terms of what will happen as a result of it. And then he went and he met the 50 congressmen and he only spoke about AI there because once again, he was worried about it. But I think it's just so far from those guys sort of line of thinking that they didn't necessarily take it on board. So those are two very sort of interesting things, you know, that, that he said which like shows that he's quite concerned about it. But then he also sort of ended it with, look, you know, we need to look at this in a, in a positive way too. We need to try and use it as, as well as we can. Um, so, yeah. And then he's working on an, another amazing project, which I know is like really interesting to Craig and maybe Craig, you want to sort of lead into it. Um, because it's, that's another fascinating part. That's, yeah, um, it really is. It's hard to understand. Wanna, <laughs> yeah, it's, this guy is so incredibly smart, isn't it? It's like, First of all, just just touching a quick two cents on that on the the sort of alignment issues of AI is like, you know, they, it's going to move into a direction where, even if it's not good or bad necessarily, I think that's what that was something I never really understood. But it it would just get so advanced that it wouldn't care, and you would just you would just become a waste of space. And and I think that's ultimately it's not i think a lot of people think of like a terminator kind of scenario but i don't think it's that it's just that you're just getting in the way of something that it's been told to do and i think that's the sort of for my side the sort of scary part but indeed gareth the the cybernetic networks as uh as as he was putting it as elon musk was putting it it just blows my mind the thought of the fact that we are actually already becoming sort of semi cyborg pe- um, beings in the fact that through social media and um, you know different uh, uh, you know especially on the net let's say our fears our wants and desires essentially our limbic system is being portrayed through those uh, digital means uh, directly to people which is which is a sort of a slow bitrate way of actually being connected to a um, to an online being and, and I think that was just super fascinating I don't know what your guys thoughts are on on that uh, what yeah, project, sorry, bro. Just quickly, just what was the project? I missed that part, bro. Um, I forget quickly now what yeah. is um oh, it's is a, Neuralink. Yeah, is yeah. it Neuralink? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. basically and, and it's yeah. and he calls it cybernetic network. So it's basically just yeah. like our uh, thoughts and uh, yeah. you know our, inter- our real the, our being is being portrayed in social media. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that I have had to to throw in here as well. Is if you look at where humans are today with their smartphones, um, you guys could ask me any question now that I shouldn't know the answer of, um, and I would get that answer relatively quickly, like literally any any question. Um, but it would be pretty inefficient because I'd unlock my phone, I'd type something into Google, I'd, I'd go and get the answer, and then I'd repeat it back to you guys. So that interface between humans and that that mechanism to provide me with those answers is inefficient and what absolutely will happen in time and exactly what Neuralink is is making that data rate and removing unlocking of phones and typing things in I'll just think something it'll 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 connect me straight into what's got the answer 
and plant a thought back in my mind. So it's immediate recollection. It's unlimited storage. Uh, and that's exactly what, what his business is aiming to achieve is kind of what exists already, but just eliminating any inefficiency yeah. in data rates and API um, between humans and that thing that you're connecting to, to make us like part robot. That's, that's essentially what you are. And that sounds scary, but it, it's kind of happening now. It's just going to be one million times more efficient once, once you're plugged in. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard for people to kind of, you know, get their heads around that. So I'm, I'm quite, I mean, in a, in a way, like I'm kind of excited about it. It's like, you know, someone asked me a question in, I don't know, Portuguese or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, cool. I can just reply to you yeah. in Portuguese because <laughs> I'm just connected straight to it. I don't need to go to my phone and go, oh yeah, I just say this word. And then, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but uh, no, it's, it's really fascinating what he's doing. What's interesting uh, about that though is I guess some, some people aren't happy with the idea of, you know, us, you know, borging up, uh, if, if I can say that, or just having access to Google all the time, for instance, they say, no, it's dumbing us down. Uh, our memories are getting worse. Uh, you know, you, you don't, you don't need to recall or you don't need to know the route to a place because you've got GPS, etc. And it's interesting because almost at every, every point in human history where there has been some sort of quantum leap in, in how we're handling information, um, we kind of get this, these self same, uh, worries being spoken of. So for example, you know, like actual writing was something that people were pushing back on because of the, the oral history um, and oral traditions that were existing at the time in many places, both in the East and the West. But over time, it just became obvious you need to be able to write in order to uh, kind of quantum leap um, you know, the, the culture forward. And similarly, so like, you know, people, you, you'll see, you know, I remember seeing a photo of uh, some people sitting in a bus, uh, you know, call it in the 40s. And, uh, and, and the caption was, you know, uh, everyone complains that, uh, you know, people are just kind of on their phones, you know, looking down and it's like this picture of like everyone in the bus kind of with their, their face stuck in a newspaper. And, and again, it's kind of, it's the same worries, you know, at that point. And so it, it is interesting to me that I definitely, you know, would agree that, uh, you know, something like Neuralink, just the concept of it is, uh, is incredible. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's just yet another sort of uh, leap in terms of our, our, you know, our ability to process information, to plug into some sort of, uh, you know, complex network, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's adding value in, in ways that I guess to, to, to Pickering's point, you know, we, we almost cannot fathom at the moment. But I, but I think for me, the big thing with the neural link though, is it's almost, um, it's almost like Musk saying, look, it's going to, like, this is going to happen. AI will, will be there. And our best hope would be that, you know, it, it shares values with us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the alternative would suck. Uh, but the only thing we can then do is really to, A, I guess, try and make sure that we, give ourselves the best chance it'll share our values. But then the other thing is how do we, you know, just have that, that link between ourselves and that computational engine be as fast and as high bandwidth as possible. And so, so it's just, it's interesting. There's always in solution mode and, uh, and as outlandish as it sounds, it's, uh, yeah, it's gotta be one of the solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's also, a, it's a little bit of an insurance policy in my opinion, uh, as well by linking yourself to it because then you're going, okay, well, essentially we part of this being and this beast potentially ourselves and if you, where you go we go kind of thing you know so it's yeah isn't the insurance policy not linking into the machine like just going yeah, to an that's island the where you find you. like i don't know yeah I, I don't want to be too skeptical about it but uh, yeah i have some real concerns about this stuff eh? you know that that machine like that just got away from itself and learning and learning go in that short amount of time scared the shit out of me like you know, just that, just that understanding and how quickly it learns and how quickly it gets stuff. Like that's the yeah. thing. It's the exponential growth curve that suddenly happens and you just, you cannot get your hands around it once it's gone. You know, we will never yeah. beat a computer. will never beat um, a human being will never beat a computer in chess ever again. That that's gone. You know, there's this, the stuff doesn't go backwards. As soon as it's happened once, it's just getting away from itself every day from there. There's, there's that story you guys might've heard about it. And I forget, I forget who wrote it. CMN, you might remember, but it's a story about the paperclip robot. Uh, Nick, Nick Bostrom. Maximizer. Yeah, Nick Bostrom. Never, you never let me down, but <laughs> <laughs> haven't, haven't yet. Don't think you ever will. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so maybe just repeat it quickly, but sure you guys know it is. So it's obviously a, 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 an untrue story, uh, um, but the humans built this, this paperclip machine and they teach it to, to build paperclips 
um, but then to be the best, most efficient paperclip machine it can be. So it needs to go into just self-learning loops and, and uh, autonomous improvement where it just becomes better and better. So it may start off making paper clips with, with steel, whatever it is, um, but then start figuring out that it can use better materials. Uh, and the end of the story is that it just eventually becomes so efficient and becomes the best paper clip machine it can be that it consumes humans to, to make paper clips. Um, so yeah, no in there did the guys say, okay, cool, we want a lot of paper clips, but let's just remind this machine that it mustn't use us to make the paper clips. And yeah. the, or, or the story is about the importance of what are, what are the circuit breakers that you're building in? Um, like you look at things like the flash crash, um, where algos took down the New York Stock Exchange, um, just massive crash in a very short amount of time. And, and that's due to not um, foreseeing what are some of the outcomes that could happen as a result of this AI. Um, and it's, it's actually easy to build those in, but the issue is what about the ones that you don't foresee? Um, like it's, I think it's forgivable to think that they wouldn't think the machine would use, hum would use humans, obviously to the complete detriment of the, of the human race. But yeah, the circuit breakers are all good and well um, if you know what all of them are. Um, and, and they can obviously be pretty inf uh, infinite. Mm -hmm. Just as so a, the there, there is briefly there, I think there is a little bit of confusion, or not confusion, um, controversy if it was Yukowski or Bostrom, just that's what I recently uh, heard. So just want to throw that in there for the record. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're going to quickly one, briefly get what you're going to say? I was going to say that um, the, one, the one area where I think um, we have already experienced this, and I'm, maybe some people are aware of it or not, but the artificial intelligence that drives the Facebook algorithm is to some extent already out of control in terms of the fact that the people that put this thing together have written an algorithm and machine learning that understands what each of us want to click on. And I'm sure all of us understand that our Facebook newsfeed is very different for each person, including in this chat, as well as for you and your wife, etc. If you open her Facebook, it looks completely different to yours. And there's that whole analogy of sending um, you know, the confirmation bias is real when um, it incentivizes you to click on articles that you like from before and it then sends you more of those types of articles. But where the machine learning sort of has got away from itself is in its ability to, a coder sits down and says, right, if Craig Hayward likes the following things, send him more of that stuff and send him more of that stuff. And the more he clicks and the more time he spends on it, send him more of that stuff. And it starts to learn the things that you like. But where it gets away from itself is this idea of not knowing where that could end up. And the whole thing with fake news and all that sort of stuff comes as a function of the fact that people create a piece of content that is just goes viral and people start to click on it. And because this machine understands and learns so quickly, even the people that have made the machine have no ability to be able to reverse that stuff backwards and get to a point where we say, actually, you know, this one wasn't quite right, you know? And mm -hmm. it's challenging because people that sit in Silicon Valley writing this code are unaware of the cultural differences and the impact that it has in places like Sri Lanka or whatever, where you're not understanding exactly what the cultural bias are, are in that space. And it can change an entire society within a couple of hours as a function of the fact that piece of content goes viral in that space. And you can't, we can't get away from that, even if we're the ones who made it. Hmm. I think that's super interesting, actually. And I always like think about it like, okay, the original code is a human. Okay, the original code is a human. So like, you might have this oak or guy or girl, or whatever, that's like, completely like in a way kind of messed up in their head you know and they've created this code and uh, the machine learns off the back of this code you know so it's it's kind of learning like bad uh, bad ways of doing things or whatever and it just carries on doing things that way so how i don't know what are your thoughts on that how is that you know how do, how do we control that sort of thing can, can i build on that um yeah. so you know, so the original human might be, you know, a pretty fucked up character. Uh, excuse my French. I don't know if you're the Your uh, French is good. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> French is fine. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, I guess the reason why the Facebooks and the Googles in particular are, uh, and the Amazons and Netflix are so good at this quote unquote machine learning stuff as well is because they have access to these massive data sets. And so, so not only, I guess, the original code base, uh, you know, might you, uh, you know, not put in the correct requires to Sean's point or, uh, or build in, you know, you know, certain biases, whether consciously or unconsciously, but then the data sets that you're using to train this AI as well 
also has an outsized effect on, uh, on ultimately how you're kind of rewarding or punishing it and, and thus teaching it what the correct behavior is. So a, uh, an example of this is, um, so we know now that uh, there have been studies in, uh, in, in, in some states in the US uh, just around using AI to, um, to fast track, um, uh, you know, like, so in jail, uh, what, what do you call it, parole. So fast track kind of parole hearings or parole decisions. And, and in order to be able to, I guess, uh -huh. have those decisions done at a much broader, a much broader scale, uh, you know, they've fed in kind of these data sets of previous, uh, you know, kind of parole hearing outcomes. But it then became clear that, in fact, there was kind of a systematic uh, racial bias in some of uh, in some of these judgments. But the thing is, that's not being fed into this machine. And so the problem is, how do you then, you know, going forward, guys will say, well, you know, look to the AI. Uh, that's the impartial uh, kind of adjudicator. But the problem is how you've taught it and how you've kind of rewarded particular decisions you've kind of already corrupted, uh, you know, the kind of the decision making. So, so things like that, you know, which are a bit more insidious, a little bit kind of, uh, you know, less flashy than, uh, you know, than kind of paperclip maximizes, but like the, the kind of the smaller things that have, you know, might have a real world impact in the next five to 10 years. I think those are the things where uh, the real concerns around machine learning and, um, and AI are actually kind of in our yeah. lifetime, to be realized. Yeah. Something to add in there. So there's the story, I'm sure you guys know, of, of Tay, the, the Twitter bot that Microsoft <laughs> yeah. created. Yeah. Um, so they create this autonomous Twitter bot 2016 um, that must go and search or, or, or poll, um, poll at least um, Twitter, learn what's going on and then start posting some comments and, and basically trying to act like a human. And I think it was pretty quickly that to shut it down because it was just starting to abuse people and fucking swear at them and like <laughs> start guys. And, and I think that what what important analogy that is is we're creating this thing, right? We're we're gonna create this AI thing or things and we're gonna teach them what to do. And then at some point they're gonna go and do their own thing, like the AlphaGo example, like say, um and that's that's really gonna test us. It's gonna test humanity and there, there are no real borders with AI. It's, good, it's going to test globalization that may force globalization to happen a lot quicker than what it would um, independently of AI. Um, and as I said earlier, like, what are our true values? What do we actually want to do here on Earth? Um, like that, that stuff's going to be amazing. And, yeah. and who knows where it goes? Like it's either going to be disastrous like that if they couldn't just turn Tay off and it just went and abused every person on Twitter, what if that's a actual machine that's walking around with some kind of, yeah, more significant force or like whatever it is. Yeah, yeah for sure. It's a good point, guys. Yeah. And, and you know, that's also why people think that's one of the reasons it might not be such a bad thing or going to be a dangerous thing in the future is because it will almost just be like our children. It will be programmed with us in it uh, theoretically and, it's one argument why uh, we don't need to be worried about it. But just moving a little bit on, I mean, with the advent of, of AI, you know, coming along so swiftly and, and potentially exponentially, um, there's the, the chance that a lot of jobs can be lost. You know, the, we can look at that both ways as well, to be honest. But in theory, you know, we've heard of the, the truck drivers in America, hundreds and thousands of them losing their jobs, not because of driverless cars sudden you're sitting with all these people without work and one solution that some people are coming up with uh, is a concept called universal basic income and uh, as a solution to that so I don't know what you got you guys have got some thoughts on it myself you know personally I think there's a few pros and cons uh, Gareth and I have had a few brief discussions about this and you know one argument for the pro is that it basically if you imagine a scenario where uh, a family is really really poor and uh, the kids are at home, but the parents are fighting, they're having to struggle. Those kids generally just are not going to be sitting reading and enjoying creative time and, and, and quality time because they, they just in this uh, space of having to just scrounge and, and what have you. But in the, in the reverse, you have a family that's got a bit of money. Those kids in general will have a little bit of time to maybe uh, sit and read and do something productive with their lives. And so the, th the theory is that if you have some UBI, maybe some of those kids out there might have that, that chance that others wouldn't just purely because they, 
uh, have uh, maybe been unlucky leading up to that point. So that's one positive. Gareth, have you got some other thoughts on, on that? Yeah, yeah, I can just kind of maybe give some real life examples of where people, where countries have actually done this for quite a while. So in the UK, you have uh, the doll and, you know, there, there's certain ways to sort of get, get it, you know, and there's different ways of getting it if you lose your job or whatever, but there's, there's one main way, which has kind of been part of the society for a long time whereby young people have kids when they're very young and as a result of that they get everything paid for they get given a house et cetera, et cetera, and they literally get paid for their whole life right so like more money than they would actually if they got a job and the issue with that is that there's no sort of sense of pride there's no understanding for value of money and there's no wanting to actually contribute and go do things they'll kind of just sit around home all day and take drugs or smoke or drink or whatever and, and really not contribute to society. So it doesn't actually do any good whatsoever besides drain the system where money could be used much better. Okay. So it's, it's kind of, that's, that's kind of basic income in a way, plus a bit more. Um, and then they have actually tried to test the theory of not the theory, but actually the use of uh, basic income in Denmark. And from what I understand is that they're actually sort of taken that back and they're like, this hasn't worked. Um, and yeah, so there, there's, I mean, there, there's ways it can, I think definitely work. Um, and it's a very interesting topic to talk about. So what do you guys think? Um, to quickly jump in here. So, so, so a, a couple of things. Uh, so I think the, the way that a lot of unemployment benefits are set up in a general sense, um, is, is, is quite different to how something like UBI would work uh, in the sense that, you know, often things like the dole will, in fact, discourage you from, uh, I guess, from earning money because of the way that there's a tiering system. And if you break this band, then you stop getting that money. And so there's almost a disincentive uh, often mm. uh, with a bunch of these programs to actually bettering yourself um, you know, even by a little bit. And so, so I think with, with UBI, I mean, Look, it's definitely a response to, I think, something that's very real and, and I think something that might, uh, might not be being taken as seriously as maybe it should be. And that is this uh, potential for large scale, massive job losses in particular in developing countries whereby, you know, it's, you know, the, the skill level of a lot of the jobs, um, you know, that, that, that are in play uh, and uh, is, is very low and those kind of routine sort of tasks uh, are exactly the, the kinds of jobs that are most in danger. And kind of that route that uh, pretty much all developed nations took to development, you know, always involved, uh, you know, kind of low skilled jobs and then slowly kind of going up the value chain sort of all over the world. And, and that route looks like it's in danger. You're seeing a lot more jobs being repatriated back to develop, uh, developed nations because now, uh, you know, kind of the cost benefit of shipping all, you know, all the, all the work to China or whatever, or what have you, uh, is no longer viable because you know what now you can bring to bear uh, machine learning and robots uh, in order to effectively get the same gains. And so, so I think that one of the big dangers is, um, I guess, in particular, developing uh, world jobs. And I think without really thinking through some potential solutions, um, naturally we've already seen, uh, even in a you know, I guess, a less prevalent AI world, we've already seen. Uh, you know, real kind of job uh, or wage growth uh, stagnating and starting to reverse. And so, so we know already that there's also a huge concentration of wealth over the last 20, 30 years, you know, and it's concentrating to a small and smaller amount of hands. And, and ultimately, AI will be to the benefit of those who hold a lot of capital to begin with. And so, you know, it's, it's just, I think it's quite dangerous, but I think UBI, uh, you know, to, to your point, it, it definitely hasn't worked, quote unquote, and, in one or two places that has been tried, I think, you know, one or two have, I think uh, Switzerland also did an experiment and they decided not to go ahead with it. Um, but I know that they are testing it in more and more places because I think unless someone can come up with a, a more radical alternative, I think we're, we're short of options, um, if, if I'm honest. But yeah, we can unpack whether UBI itself is. I think, um, I think there needs to be a way, and I'm not sure it needs to be UBI, but exactly what you've said, the challenge is that the people that already have 
um, the most amount of capital are the people that are going to continue to get more of it. And it just ends up being a capital flow from those that don't have anything to, um, to those that have everything. And um, I think uh, whether UBI is the, op the option or not, I think it, there definitely needs to be something to basically spread that wealth around. You know, the, the people that have a lot are just continuing to get more and more and more. And that uh, less than 1% of the world that holds so much is just going to continue to get more in this space. And I think maybe the one thing which was pretty relevant for me recently was not only at the lower end of jobs, um, you know, where people are basically packing boxes and that type of stuff and maybe driving trucks seems to be evident as well. But even on the top end, you know, and the basically the, the neurosurgeon who has spent, you know, 10, 15 years qualifying to be a neurosurgeon um, has a massive debt to pay back for his for his tertiary studies and stuff that he's got. He's pretty much going to be out of work in a couple of years' time as a function of that the machine is always going to be better and more skilled and doesn't make mistakes and doesn't have a hangover when you're out at work. And the, he's going to be at the other end of the scale of people that potentially are also a casualty of um, of AI. And um, yeah, it's going to. Whether UBI is the solution or not, I think AI is going to present social challenges at a level that I think is going to make us as a community globally have to look at this at some point and just, um, you know, there's this analogy that the people that are eventually, when it becomes so disparate, the, the wealth inequality becomes so disparate, you have a few people moving around in armored cars from fortress to fortress mm. while the rest of us stand outside waiting to see what the heck we're going to do with our day. You know what I mean? At some point, they're going to be like, this is actually not fun anymore. We need to make a plan to fix this. And um, what that looks like, maybe UBI is an opportunity. The one thing I would say, and um, I think UBI, much like Gareth spoke about the dole initially, I believe it comes down to like an alignment issue, like an, an incentive issue. If you set the incentives up right, I believe, I believe most people have an incentive to want to do the right thing, to make a difference in the world, to be able to get up and, um, you know, do work that matters and, you know, make a difference in the world, however that looks. And I think if the incentive is to never uplift yourself because it's better for you to just stay at home and drink, um, you know, or disability, there's a story about this, um, uh, this woman who was um, disincentivized to do anything in case, because she was on disability pay, she was disincentivized to go and look for work in any degree as a function of the fact that somebody may have seen her as being able-bodied and she potentially lost her disability payout. There's a misalignment of incentive there where the person, like you said, just needs to have a reason to want to go out there. And UBI seems to address that to some extent, you know, like you get the money no matter what. Um, and if you go out there and empower yourself and be better, um, UBI is a way of redistributing that wealth to, to everybody, but it doesn't take away the incentive to want to go and still better yourself or make a difference. Mm -hmm. so, so what if we extrapolate that idea to a point where AI has literally taken over every bit of work, every bit of menial, boring, hard labor, every job that we could ever imagine. And we basically live in a, a sort of a utopia uh, or, or a dystopia, whatever you, however you choose to see it, where that we don't have to work. Then what is the solution then? Because that, that's, that is theoretically possible down the track with like incredible general intelligence doing all the hard work for us. Is, is it, does that, does universal basic income become a, or an option then? So yeah, to, to jump in there, that's definitely where, where my thinking and my kind of investigation and studying around it is, is taking me. So first time I thought about UBI was Craig, when you asked me, what are my thoughts on UBI about a month ago? And I was like, <laughs> what's UBI? <laughs> um, but found it a pretty, uh, pretty interesting topic post that and, and nothing like a podcast with four other highly intelligent individuals to make you <laughs> views on it a bit but anyway so so obviously ubi not a new thing right um i think thomas moore first in in his book utopia like 1500s somewhere around there um, and i think there it was more about inequality like um given given inequality as a result of capitalism or whatever it is um this concept of ubi um could be the solution to that and exactly as you guys have said um, the more recent debates and, and interest in it is as a result more of AI and what AI could um, or, or what could eventuate as a result of AI in terms of job loss. So my initial thoughts were, okay, but why is this, this whole AI revolution different to something like the industrial revolution? Like we, we got through that, we didn't lose jobs. Craftsmen mm -hmm. moved onto the production line. 
Um, there were different types of jobs. So like, why is this going to be different? Um, and it, it seems like there's two factors. The one is it's going to happen a whole lot quicker than something like the industrial revolution did. Um, and also those, those production line and whatever jobs will be taken up by machines, like things like robotic process automation, which are taking thousands of jobs and smart jobs, like financial jobs, accounting jobs are, are just being automated in what's actually a, a pretty simple mechanism. Um, but anyway, I, I, I think it is, it looks like that is um, a decent deduction is that there's going to be this massive loss of jobs. It's 9 million, whatever drivers in the U S professional drivers, as an example. Um, so let's assume that does happen. Um, the, you, you then need some sort of solution to that. What are you doing with all these individuals that have no longer got work? And for me, the, the one approach is to say, okay, cool, let's just give everyone the same amount of money um, so that it's, it's less of an issue. And that feels like a little bit of a cynical negative approach to, to me You're saying, okay, cool, we've created something. People now are unable to have the same earning potential. So let's give a bit of a donation. Like it feels more socialist, heavy left type of approach. For me, a better way to look at it is with the introduction of AI, we've almost got an opportunity to reinvent ourselves. Like, what do we as humans want to do? If we can invent machines that do all the, the manual labor um, and do all the things that, that humans do currently and uh, work has now become synonymous with life, right? It's just a huge part of what most mm. people do, except Gareth Pickering. Um, <laughs> so, so if we've got this opportunity to redefine that and we decide, relationships are more important for us spending time with loved ones um all those things that that are way more meaningful to humans rather than than work um and ubi as a mechanism to help us unlock that like that makes a huge amount of sense to me hmm. i almost wonder I, like if we are gonna go sort of full full circle as a result so like we have all the machines that end up doing you know our current jobs and what we do is we kind of, you know, retreat a little bit from the cities and we go back, back to the farmlands and we, we start hanging out more and we start like, you know, um, making our own food and growing our own food and just being a bit more of a community because everything else works. We don't really need too much because the machines are doing it. We, we don't need too much money because, you know, it, you know, everything's either so cheap or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of goes back to you know, 100, 200 years ago. What are your thoughts about that? I like that. I like that utopian idea. I think at the moment we have this, um, you know, where work is so synonymous with what we do that everybody thinks that they need to have a job, but there are so many people in so many meaningless jobs, like, you know, factory line assembly people and cashiers in stores and, you know, even, even in retail, like people need that work because they need that work. But if, if machines are able to do that better, I would really, I'd like to see that we have a solution where the wealth is distributed equally, that people can do things that matters, matter. And that whole idea of having to work as part of your social construct that you have to go and do something every single day, specifically the people that are doing really meaningless work because they've got bills to pay. Like I see it as a potential upside. If we can find a solution, call it UBR or similar that works, I, I believe that would, that would make the world a much better place. Eh? Mm -hmm. Just, so just asking you a question on back of the back of that, uh, Gareth is, um, would, would that in theory then only work in the utopian world of everything being done by the AI? It's going to be a gradual process, but I think the idea that we have um, priced um, people's hands at a, at a rate, which is, you know, we could potentially take some money from the haves, like a taxation of some description on large tech companies and pay that to the people that are responsible now for sitting behind a cash register all day going ding, 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 ding. Like that person, I don't see anybody that has a, a really meaningful existence working in a Walmart as a cashier. They need to pay bills and that's what it is. So. I don't know what it looks like. I mean, potentially utopia would be an ideal situation where they can do whatever they like because it's taken care of. But I, I don't know. I would like to see it like that. You know, that Gareth's analogy of just everyone doing things that matter, hang out with people that you care about, your family, you know, not have to go and do that work because it's done by somebody else, you know. Um, if anybody wants to read a book called 2150 AD, it's sort of a fantasy sci-fi type thing. 
um, where they talk about an ideal world that starts to get a little bit fluffy in places, but um, they talk about this world where it exists almost like this. And it's, um, it's a really interesting read about what our world could look like um, if the machine was trusted by everybody, it was aligned the right way, people did exactly what they needed to, there was no requirement for things, you know, everybody had everything that they needed. And I don't see that with the efficiencies that things like AI will bring, that that's impossible, you know what I mean? Like, you know, farming and packing boxes and that type of stuff, driving trucks, cashing out at registers and that sort of stuff will happen automatically. We don't need to spend people doing that. And, you know, there's more than enough money to go around if it's distributed equally. You guys got anything else to add there? Very, very interesting topic. And I think, I think that um, just that point of, uh, you know, our psychological need to, you know, you know, be useful and get up and actually do something, uh, you know, that, that's definitely, UBI is definitely more of a, or should be more of a net. There is a, an acceptable bottom that you can fall to, uh, but but the upside should, you know, by and large, let me say, uh, kind of all be yours. Uh, but I think we're, we're definitely already seeing just, you know, the, just the nature of the world in terms of, you know, sharing economy, in terms of how people are starting to um, kind of support, uh, you know, artists or, or intellectuals or, or what have you, who they, who they appreciate, just like that model is definitely changing. And I think it's just going to continue to accelerate in, in those sorts of ways and, and, and hopefully, uh, to your point, Gareth, may maybe not everyone goes to, uh, to to the mountains or, or to the fields, uh, but uh, but you know, yeah, starts to do you know, other artisanal things or, or, or more writing, more poetry, more more rap uh, if it's from Nicholson or, or, or whatever. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so, so yeah, it's definitely it, it. There is a potential for a more utopian play um, if we uh, if we if we play our cards right. But I think often it's not. Often it's, it's political uh, issues uh, and, and how we relate to each other that are the problem rather than that the data says we should do something or it being clear that we need to go in a particular direction. And so I just saw so the implementation of UBI. UBI is because it looks or feels or smells like a giant doll, uh, it's just very, it's a politicized story. And, uh, you know, and, and it, it might seem even less obvious than something like, um, you know, trying to address global warming and we're struggling at that. And so, mm. so I think my, my concerns would be definitely more kind of how would we actually do it in a political mm. Yeah. Just, just to add to that, something that's quite scary is the people that are implementing this or the people that have got the power to decide whether this is something we do or not um, and, and to draw on the, the current leadership in the US and Trump and um, obviously not wide in, in what he's doing. Um, South Africa, uh, in terms of some of the leadership and, and challenges we're going through in SA, if you're leaving it up to those guys to decide, right, is this something we do or not? Like that's a bit of a scary thought, right? Um, so you may get to a point where you design this amazing thing on paper that's cool, like let's say UBI is it, let, let's go for it. Um, are those same smart people the ones that are actually implementing it? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a very, very, very good point. Uh, I think everyone should uh, have a check out if you haven't. The uh, David, uh, sorry, Andrew Yang, uh, who's actually running for 2020 presidency. He's a, a big uh, advocate for for UBI, and he's uh, certainly got some interesting to, uh, sort of uh, points to make about UBI. And I certainly personally look forward to a world where uh, we can just explore our creativity and relationships as you guys have mentioned that that sounds like a utopia to me indeed as long as we can find purpose in helping others or, or something uh, to that equivalent uh, i think that would be a good way to go that yeah. andrew yang is a good place to start like um you know i think he's i think america has trump because they were tired of every other potential alternative the voting public of america voted for trump for those reasons i think if uh, i think his, his name is andrew yang yeah um, he, if he makes some, some groundwork and uh, connects with people at the level that are casting votes in America was to go that route, yeah, that would be a really good start, I think. And I'm not sure where it goes to from there, but if somewhere like America could you know, gather support and uh, groundswell like in terms of being able to get somebody like that into power that had that sort of uh, an agenda, um, 
it would be an amazing start. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's, it's super interesting. Like, you know, what you said there, Sean, uh, I wonder if actually if a byproduct and a, and a advantage of AI is that actually the way governments, I guess, are kind of structured at the moment changes and we end up having better leadership and better control. I don't know, like maybe, maybe that is, is one of the eventualities. It'll be quite, quite nice if it is because it actually hasn't necessarily worked for even maybe since it was ever sort of put together. Um, so, you know, and we do need some sort of change there. And maybe this, this is going to create the transparency and whatever else we need to, to create that shift, shift in leadership and governments. Um, yeah, who knows, I guess. But, um, but, but yeah, just, just to finish this off, you know, like let's, let's have a quick little uh, round table maybe. I don't know. You can spend 30 seconds if you want just, say, just saying something to finish off. And also if you're excited about it, scared or against it, and you can't be in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so Craig, I'll start. I, 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 I'll start off. But yeah, yeah. I think um, I, the, 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 main, the things I mentioned earlier, I'm excited. Uh, you have, I feel you one has to be excited for the future. Uh, it's the only way and things can go bad. All technology can go, can go off the rails and be super scary, but we also are involved at this stage. Um, and at this stage we have to put our best intentions and our best efforts into making positive things where we are creating that utopia for all people. So while that chance still exists, I'm positive. Cool stuff. How about you guys? So I am, um, I'm also largely positive. I mean, the concerns that I had earlier are, are concerns and I think whatever happens, I think it's going to potentially present um, challenges to us as a nation, as a country, as a population, as a community that we will need to address somehow. And um, yeah, I think at some point, somebody's going to look around and go like, oh, we need to fix this in some way. And I think uh, this may be the thing that potentially aligns us to sit around the table and hopefully have a, a conversation, you know, about, about potentially bigger things. So um, I think uh, while I am concerned at some level, I think it's got massive potential. We didn't speak too much about like the, the ability that um, technology has in terms of like furthering education and its ability to be able to increase farming yields and get rid of people going to bed hungry, those sorts of things are hugely, hugely positive, you know, and um, I think, uh, yeah, there are some downsides, but it's going to present a challenge to us that'll, like I said, hopefully get us to, you know, work together on, on a potentially big problem. Yeah, I definitely would tend to agree. Um, also incredibly excited by, um, by the prospect, also, you know, sort of cautious though about some of the implications and, uh, and uh, but, but also aware that it ultimately it's, it's an opportunity for us to, to Sean's point earlier as well, is to just rethink what are the things that are uh, important to us and, um, and it's kind of a crucible that's forcing us to confront, uh, you know, things, what is important to us, even things like our ethics, um, how, you know, how do we, what are our ethical standards? How, how, how would we possibly codify those in order to try and ensure that you know, artificial intelligence shares our ethics, um, you know, and so, so I think it's a, it's a, yeah, it's, we're definitely at, a, at an interesting crossroads and, uh, and, and ultimately all these things are tools and how we bring those to bear is definitely more going to be a reflection of us than uh, any intrinsic uh, quality of those tools. Mm. Cool. So yeah, definitely following the trend of, of, of you three, um, Still, Musk's comment from the Rogan podcast was would definitely rather be positive and and wrong than than cynical and, and yeah. negative and right. Um, yeah, I, I, it's massively exciting. Like, I had a bit of a realization a, a year or so ago where we are going to see some amazing shit before we die. Um, God forbid that doesn't happen unexpectedly in the next day or two. Um, <laughs> uh, like, think about it. When we have whatever 50, 60, 70. The, the kind of toys our grandchildren are going to play with and the kind of tech we're going to be exposed to is just going to be completely off the charts. Like I, I don't even think we can, we can fathom. So from that point of view, just personal ability to experience that stuff like that is hugely, hugely exciting. Um, and then just talking broader AI humanity stuff, definitely 
uh, feel the same. Um, there's no doubt there's a huge amount of risk and a huge amount of downside. But I think if we're, if we're deliberate about it um, and we, we get the right people um, all pulling in the right direction um, and, and we're deliberate about the outcomes that we want and, and are thinking about all those different eventualities and, and, and that as much as possible, like it, it, it can change the game, right? It, it's going to change the game. Um, we just got to make sure that that's for the, the betterment of, of everybody. Yeah. And just to finish off, uh, Gareth, uh, we haven't heard your views, and uh, yeah. uh, let's uh, let's hear what you got to, what you got to say about this, buddy. <laughs> so I'm definitely not going to be the one to bring it out. <laughs> like, <laughs> all positive so far. Like I'm, I'm super excited about it. Actually, I think with every new invention, there is uh, there's always these challenges, and there's a great book called The Innovator's Dilemma, and you know everything that is created has something that it uh, you know like it, it causes an issue for so i think this is just another example of that it's on a bigger scale we just really need to come together to to think how we're going to make this work i think it's super exciting in terms of you know things like uh, we're going to hopefully live live longer you know like everyone will hopefully live to like the, i don't know 120 that's just quite exciting um and you know, there's many other things that to, to get excited about. It's just, it's just we need to do it properly, and uh, it's going to take. I think it's going to take, you know, conversations like these. You know, first of all, just to get people talking about it, and then obviously we need somehow that structure with government and these guys that are creating all of this stuff to sort of come together and to make sure that it's governed properly and just works well. So I'm super excited about it, and. Um, I'm super thankful for this chat as well. Like it's actually been, it's been such an awesome chat. Uh, you guys are so smart and um, uh, really it's been a privilege having you on our second uh, panel discussion. So, you know, uh, just really, really cool. I appreciate it. And it's, it's really sort of given me some new things to think about as well. Yeah, I think you were right, Gareth. It's just opening discussions like this are, are so important and uh, I'm very grateful to you guys too. At the beginning you said none of us are experts, but uh, you could have all fooled me tonight. So thank you so much, uh, everybody. And uh, look forward to our next chat. Thank you. Yeah, from, from my side as well, guys, amazing to finally get this together. Amazing topics. Well done. Awesome to see you, Gareth, Craig, what you guys are doing. Loving, loving the podcast. Good to meet you, Gareth. Good to see you pick as see a man. A very, very cool shot guys. Cool, man. Thanks a lot, buddy. Good to meet you as well, bud. Thank you, buddy. At uh, five o'clock in the morning, is it too early to have a beer? <laughs> <laughs> How about some red wine, buddy? It was like Friday, <laughs> Friday after work. Depends if, getting, if, depends if you're getting home or waking up, bud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice one, boys. Nice yeah, to see thanks you. Thanks for making it so early. More planned. Yeah, man. Nice to see you. See you. It's been a long time, brother. Yeah, it has been. Uh, yeah, uh, again, thanks a lot, guys. Very, yeah, very cool chat. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, I'm glad it, uh, it finally happened. Yeah, I did. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.